Um, so the um, construction of states post-conflict is a complicated and layered topic, as we have seen discussion on in the previous two events. In this panel, we will discuss important aspects of developing post-conflict states relating to security institutions and economic development. We will have staggered presentations for the panelists. First, we will have a discussion on the role of security in institutions. Our first speaker joining us today is political science professor Isla M. Matinock at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research examines a variety of international and domestic influences on the stability of fragile states, especially elections in these contexts, bringing together insights from international relations and comparative politics, as well as policing and community attitudes during crisis. She seeks to better understand how different actors can foster peace and improve governance outcomes. She is the author of Electing Peace from Civil Conflict to Political Participation. She will present first and we will have a brief Q&A followed by Professor Skaperidas' presentation, which will be followed by open Q&A for attendees. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Mika. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, with you. I am going to share some slides. Wonderful. Okay, so um, what I want to present today is some work that is related to a new book project that I'm working on, which is called Inviting Intervention, State Building by Delegating Security. And in it, I'm going to talk about sort of different ways in which we think about um, state building with regard to security institutions and broadly um, to post-conflict uh, context in particular. Um, and then I want to push uh, for this idea about thinking about places where states themselves actually invite intervention by international actors in forms that are um, shared sovereignty. So, um, there we go. Uh, what we're looking at, uh, thinking about um, today is state building broadly. State building um, can be thought of as both a domestic process or an international process. Um, so states with ineffective security institutions um, produce instability not only for their own citizens, so uh, you know, disrupting people's daily lives, but also have these sort of problems of uh, spreading transnational threats to other states. The big question in policy worlds has been, can state building help? And in particular, what international policymakers usually mean about this is can intervening by an outside actor, by an international actor, into this state help. Um, so these fragile states often struggle to strengthen and reform their own institutions. Um, and I call these fragile states, that term is sometimes politicized, but I really mean this in terms of having institutions that are not stable and sort of long lasting and secure. And especially today we'll be focused on the security institutions. Um, traditional state building efforts have really mixed records about whether or not they help with these uh, interventions or not. Um, you know, when you think of state building, you probably these days think about Afghanistan or Iraq, um, which have been, you know, notably problematic cases. And uh, so thinking about going forward, there are sort of these geostrategic politics and resource constraints that make that type of state building at a minimum pretty rare. So the big question is, are there other options? Um, and what I want to highlight today is thinking about cooperative arrangements between host states and outside actors, which I think are an underexplored, uh, underappreciated, and yet pretty common mechanism um, of state building, as I'll show you from some of my um, recent work. Okay, so what I wanna do in the talk is talk about um, sort of four different things. Uh, thinking about the concept um, is what we're gonna do mainly uh, in these um, you know, 20 minutes or so. Um, so we'll think about the, the concept of invited intervention, especially along sort of a shared sovereignty dimension. Why is this shared sovereignty? How is this shared sovereignty when we get these um, particular types of arrangements? And then the concept of state building versus state backing, um, which I think fundamentally is about reform. I'll talk more about that. And then I'll show you just a little bit of preliminary data. This is not the final cleaned version of the data, but showing that these invited interventions are actually pretty common in practice and suggesting some ways forward that this concept should point us in terms of thinking about where we might go um, with uh, state building going forward. So starting with the concept of invited interventions, particularly in terms of shared sovereignty. There is a little bit of work on shared sovereignty. Um, 
weak states, often designated as weak states, um, may be willing to relinquish some of their international sovereignty for domestic sovereignty. So here we're especially thinking about what's often referred to as Westphalian um, sovereignty, which is the, basically the ability for host states to keep other actors out of their domestic processes. Um, they're often willing to relinquish that in order to get better stability um, it, within their states. And so this work, you know, builds on especially Krasner, Steve Krasner's um, work, thinking about this in his Shared Sovereignty book, um, but also many others, um, Thomas Rissa, David Lake's work, and others. Um, so what we want to think about, though, is how states share sovereignty. So sh shared sovereignty is often sort of a pretty general term that's used, and it's actually used to, to capture a pretty diverse set of cases. Um, what I think of uh, as shared sovereignty or a type of shared sovereignty that I'd like to highlight in this project is that there are these invited interventions in which um, host states consent to other sovereign entities. So these have to be foreign states or intergovernmental organizations, other actors that also have sovereignty, taking temporary authority to implement policies or laws within the host state's own territory and over its citizens. So not just deciding whether or not to give aid, but actually being part of the process of actually doing um, the implementation of a policy within the state and that affects its citizens. So crucially, these missions have, um, you know, this foreign sovereign entity working in the host state territory with jurisdiction over its host state citizens, right? That's sort of the, the fundamental executive function that these outside actors have. The host states um, in these cases consent to a contract. So what they're doing here is they're actually using their international legal sovereignty to sign some sort of deal. These are often formal treaties. They don't have to be, but they're often formal treaties that allow this outside actor in for a set period. So the whole process occurs in this system of sovereign statehood. And so by signing this contract, they're actually in some ways reinforcing their own sovereignty even as they're delegating some of their sovereignty. And so this is why I think of these as very much um, shared sovereignty instances. These don't have to be uh, symmetrical bargaining uh, processes, right? It may be that the outside actor has more um, capabilities, uh, like military capabilities, for example, than the host state does. So they can be asymmetric bargaining processes, but they're still bargaining processes that are leading to a contract, which in theory should improve sort of the status quo option for both sides. I think that these processes where you're getting a contract gives us sort of the best chance of sustaining the contract, given that it is with these two sovereign entities within what is an anarchical system, but one that hinges on the sovereign statehood, right? So by through signing these contracts between these two different sovereigns, um, they're actually sort of reinforcing the process by which they both are given their own power. And so this is what makes these arrangements to me very much shared sovereignty at its core um, and really interesting. My study, so the, the book project that I have uh, specifically focuses on these invited intervention in state security institutions. So thinking about policing, investigating, prosecuting, and judging here. Um, these can also operate in like banking or you know, other sectors, but these are the ones that I focus on uh, in this study. So just to show you a little bit and give you sort of a, a better sense of the different types of sovereignty uh, arrangements that we can be thinking of here, um, you know, what I'm thinking of on the on the y axis here is is sovereignty taken over by the international actor on the left hand side of your screen and sovereignty retained entirely by the host state on the right hand side of your screen. And what I really want to get into is sort of this middle area where you have shared sovereignty, but let me just briefly say what I think is going on in the two um, side columns, because I think that this is where a lot of the state building work actually lives currently. So on the left hand side, um, we can think about foreign imposed regime changes or other invasions. These are cases in which these states fight their way in and then take over the state or simply uh, depose the existing regime um, and then leave it to chance as to who's set up afterwards. Um, these cases can spill over into neo-trusteeships, but neo-trusteeships can be a little bit separate from this. So this is where the UN in particular in recent years has sort of taken over a state um, and administered it until it becomes independent. These are especially in new states, so Kosovo and Timor-Leste, as they're emerging from um, you know, being part of another state um, that they may be administered by an international system. 
There are some pro-regime stability or status quo defending operations that can exist here, especially if perhaps like the leader has just faced a coup and has just been deposed, then you might sort of see an international actor entering without formal permission um, from, the, from the state itself, but basically assisting the regime that's in power. Almost all of these uh, in the, in the left-hand side of your screen are what we refer to as international state building in most of the existing literature. Most of these then have some sort of transitional administration whereby they hand power back over to the, inter, uh, to the domestic uh, state, um, a newly created domestic state in many of these cases. And that can be sort of the trickiest part of these operations, but all of them also of course are critiqued for um, imperialism um, and neocolonialism because these are sort of fundamentally operating at the international community's uh, impetus, maybe uh, if they're UN operations or simply a foreign state um, going in and changing the regime of another state. So those are very much you know, sovereignty taken over by an outside actor. On the right hand side of your screen, you have cases in which international actors are operating in which they're intervening in some way, but sovereignty is retained entirely by the host state. So these could be cases where the international actors are trying to change the state fundamentally. So they might be giving aid to rebel groups um, so they might overthrow the state. Um, they might be giving conditional aid to the government so that it will change its policies and practices in order to get that conditional aid. Um, or they might just be giving regular pro-regime aid um, or even this could be foreign um, contractors or personnel who are working just within the state as contractors, right? So they're just working uh, on, on what the state asks them to work on. In all of those cases, the state itself may be trying to strengthen, strengthen and perhaps change its institutions, but it's really not um, sharing sovereignty with anyone, right? It might be taking aid, but it's not sort of uh, sharing its authority with, with any of these outside actors. Training operations slide a little bit into allowing the outside actor to have some say over how, for example, military oper um, operatives in their state are trained, like what the rules are that they operate by, but even those tend to have mostly the sovereignty retained entirely by the host. So I think the interesting set here are these invited interventions, which are really clearly shared sovereignty agreements, right, in that these are host states that are actually asking these outside actors to come into the state for a limited period of time and help with um, some of these security functions. Um, okay, so, oops. Um, so that gives us sort of a, a sovereignty concept uh, of these uh, international actors and what they're doing here. I think we also wanna think about this state building versus state backing dimension of the concept um, that I'm defining in this book project. So in practice, I think these missions come in really different forms. State backing missions can provide just capacity alone for these international, uh, sorry, for these domestic states. So, um, you know, if a state is facing a rebellion, uh, you know, in part of its country, and it simply wants another country to come in and assist us with, assist it with fighting that um, rebellion, it might have a state backing mission, right? That would be very different from a state building mission that has a component of reform. So these reforms change, but usually also standardize the security process that contributes in some way to the rule of law. So in many cases, um, these could just change the institution. So it could change from like favoring one group to favoring another group. But in practice, what they're usually doing is sort of trying to make everyone a little bit more equal in the eyes of the law, right? In the ways in which the security sector is applied. Um, in practice, um, the ways in which international actors usually are involved in this, it can involve um, changing personnel or particular policies within bureaus. Um, so they might be operating within like the police department. Um, it can involve changing bureaus themselves. So it might demobilize some units, um, set up new units that maybe are going to be more um, multi-ethnic, for example, in some contexts, especially post-conflict contexts. And it can even be changing the laws that the bureaus put in place and potentially the ways in which the bureaus are overseen in their work, right? So it might be putting them under um, legislatures, for example, and showing them how to report to those legislatures. So both of these types of missions, I would argue, fit in this central column, in the shared sovereignty column, but they have these very big differences in terms of whether or not they have a mandate for reform. So the state building missions, which I call in my work governance delegation agreements, are the ones that have some sort of reform component to them. 
and they are invited interventions, but they are state building invited interventions. So mandate for reform is sort of the top part of this chart now on the Y axis. And on the bottom part, we have these state backing missions where you're just coming in and aiding a, a foreign actor. As you can see, the other types of missions also um, break by this, uh, you know, mandate for reform or not. So foreign imposed regime changes, as well as most neo trusteeships are fundamentally about changing or setting up new institutions in these states, whereas pro regime stability or status quo defending operations would not be right, they would just be backing sort of the administration that exists. The same thing with aid so aid to rebels um, right, would be fundamentally trying to change the state. Conditional aid and democracy promotion would also be trying to get some change in the state, um, whereas pro-regime aid or private foreign contractors or personnel um, would very much be just supporting the institution that exists. So no mandate for reform there. So I'm going to talk briefly about whether state building is, um, in terms of invited intervention is common in practice um, before getting to some conclusions and wrapping up here in the next uh, few minutes. So. I wanted to identify possible cases of invited intervention. And so I've coded data between 1980 and 2015 with the help of both undergraduate and graduate student um, research assistants here at Berkeley. And what we did was we set up to code um, a set of all sources that we could think of that would help us identify any and all instances in which foreign troops, police, investigators, prosecutors, or other security sector personnel were sent into these host states. Um, and so we looked at like the foreign forces and military balance, which is notoriously unreliable. So we always tried to um, cross validate those. Um, we looked at treaties and agreements. Um, we looked at IO reported missions. We looked at particular categories of aid or training that are reported to see if they were particularly sending foreign personnel. And we did a bunch of other searches which are standardized in our code book. We then verified all of these cases I mentioned, so through official mission or state websites, um, through academic sources or policy literature, and through news reports. And we're still in the process of coding, but what we wanted to code in particular was missions, all missions that are operating in these countries, and then coding whether or not they entered by consent. So confirming that these missions were carrying out executive functions in the policing or judicial sector, there are some difficult cases to define on this. So um, many of you probably saw um, the tragic incident in Niger where a US service um, person was killed. And I think that that is one of these cases that's a little bit hard to define in our data set because many of these are defined as training missions and they're stating that they're only training personnel. But in fact, um, especially when these operations go wrong, we find out that they're also operating in these countries. So we wanted to be able to detect any cases in which they are also operating in these countries. And so we have coding rules that seek to do this um, and to give us the benefit of the doubt if we think they might be operating. We define both implicit and explicit consent. So did the host state just cooperate with the mission or did it like formally ask for this through an agreement or a treaty? Um, and then we determine whether or not there's state backing, which is just sort of this contributing capacity alone or state building, which also has this reform component. We also tried to co code some of these other factors like who's leading the mission, their budget and the number of personnel, but those are harder um, to find. So we have more missing data on those variables. Overall, this is, uh, I should mention, a first cut at the data, so please don't cite these numbers. We are undergoing a second coding round, um, and so it's almost certain that these numbers will change, and any bias in them is not known because we added a couple of different um, coding steps, which I think will find more cases. We don't know where they'll find more cases, um, but, but uh, so take this as preliminary data, please. Um, but what we find is basically that there are a huge number of um, missions operating in general uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, so I should mention this is Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and this is between 1980 and 2015, as I mentioned. So of all of the, the missions that enter these countries, about 73% of them seem to enter with consent. So this is that they have some sort of consent from the host state. If we think about the way in which we define state building and if we're thinking about Afghanistan and Iraq in our minds, it turns out that that's actually, at least in our data in the Sub-Saharan Africa data set in these preliminary data, a minority of cases, right? That's only these 27% of cases where um, states are kind of forcing their way in. In most of the cases, they're actually being invited in by these host states. And then the state building and state backing missions are pretty equal. So in about half the cases, little less than half the cases, these states are actually asking for reform, not just for capacity building. 
Um, and overall, the missions occur in about 77% of all of these sub-Saharan African states um, and in about 10% of the country years total. Um, again, preliminary data, so take this with a grain of salt, but this is just to give you an idea of what's um, there in the data set. Okay, so where does this concept point us? I've talked a lot about um, this concept, which I think is important and, and a bit different than how we usually think about state building. So I think uh, intervention seems to be often invited, at least in the data we've examined so far and some other cases that I examined in this book project in Guatemala, uh, Solomon Islands, so very different contexts, we're seeing this type of invited intervention. Interveners can provide additional capacity and either a loyal force to back the incumbent or a relatively neutral or untouchable force to bind the leader's hands, as I argue in the case of reform. This points us to some crucial characteristics of these missions. They often add capacity, but they also lock in a more removed force from the state politics, right? They might not be unbiased in the general sense of the word, but they're at least not involved in sort of whatever system exists in the state. And that has both pros and cons. Finally, it raises questions about when they occur and to what effect, like why would states want to invite in these foreign actors, especially to reform um, their institutions? I argue in the book project that it's about tying hands for these states so that they can make credible commitments to their opponents that they actually will change. Um, and so that's sort of the direction forward. That's what I, what I write about in the book, but I wanted to give you especially an overview of the concept here um, to get you thinking about sort of how we change security institutions in states that have fragile um, security institutions. And I think international intervention remains pretty important here, but that we should often be thinking about this invited intervention, these invited forms of intervention rather than just imposed uh, invasions. So I'll stop there. I look forward to your, your questions and um, the other presentation and general questions as well. Yes, thank you so much. Um, that was such an interesting talk. I'm, I'm genuinely learning so much. And um, as an IR major, this, these talks are always so exciting to go to, to learn more. Um, so there is a Q&A um, option down on the um, screen below. So if people uh, want to collect their thoughts and submit questions. So, but while we wait for people to do that, um, I have some couple of questions. Um, the things that you talked about. So you said that you know, host states or right, host states um, conduct an invited, inviting um, and shared sovereignty to help build back their states. Um, and I just, I'm just curious about some of the major incentives for some states to, to invite other states because personally, I don't, like I don't find it that, I didn't know it was a common um, practice in the first place, because it seems as if you invite some other foreign sovereignty or state into your own, it could cause, you know, um, like tensions or just more problems that could, you know, uh, digress from the progress of, of state building. So what are some of the major incentives for your states to do that? That's a great question. I'm glad you have this question because that is the motivating puzzle for this book project. Um, so I've talked a lot about the concept here, but, but the book is actually about why states would be willing to have this type of intervention, why they would be willing to invite this type of intervention. And so I think there are a few circumstances under which um, states with fragile security institutions really want to tie their own hands. Um, one is post-conflict context, especially if you have a power sharing regime set up it's very hard for the government to trust the rebels and the rebels to trust the government as they're both demobilizing, right, and trying to set up a, a regime together, um, that sometimes having this external actor that's actually pushing and implementing the reforms that they've usually agreed on in the peace process, but is actually like overseeing this, that can be one case in which we see these types of shared sovereignty um, arrangements, right? And it kind of makes sense there because the government wants it not to constrain themselves, but to constrain the rebels, and the rebels want it not to constrain themselves, but to constrain the government, right? So, so those make sense um, to me, at least, uh, hopefully to you all. Um, and then I think there are, are, are other circumstances that are pretty similar under which um, leaders would want to tie their opponents' hands. So I think in many of these cases, what we saw, at, we're seeing at least in the preliminary data, and we'll see if it holds as we finalize the data and rerun the analyses, is that um, 
places where leaders basically think they're about to lose um, to an opposition, they may be more inclined to set these up. So either uh, in the face of an election that looks like they're probably going to lose, or when they have a really high coup threat um, that looks like they're about to be deposed, they may actually set up one of these with the outside actor. This gives them like a last ditch effort at showing that they're really committed to reform. So it might help them, you know, not get um, deposed or not get uh, turned over in an election. But if they do lose, then their opponent at least has their hands tied, right? And so that can actually behoove them in those cases as well. So those are some of the circumstances under which I find that, or I think that leaders will want to tie their own hands and we're finding that um, to be consistent in sort of the preliminary data and the case studies. As I mentioned, there are in-depth case studies here on Central America where Guatemala has been a major case um, that has this type of intervention. And in the Pacific, um, Solomon Islands has been a major case with this type of intervention where Australia took the lead on that. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, so I'll ask one more question before we move on to Mr. Scaperdas, this presentation. Um, but you earlier said that the state building changes um, or the standardizing of the security process contributes to you know, changing or standardizing the rule of law. And that involves changing the bureaus and laws. And so how do you think, I'm curious on how that like reflects on the people and like this actual citizens of the states. And have you seen examples of like backlash or um, yeah, backlash from the people um, themselves against this shared sovereignty? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that there are I think we should almost expect backlash in these cases. You know, there are a lot of sort of state building um, pieces that look at these and say, oh, you know, we're seeing this backlash sometimes. Why do we see this? Like, maybe is there cases in which the outside actors' incentives are not aligned with the domestic actors' incentives. But the way in which I'm setting up the theory here, I think any time that you're using an outside actor to tie the hands of the domestic actors, like that is what they're setting it up to do, right? Is inherently to have some conflict between the domestic actors and international actors because you're relying on this outside actor to tie the hands of the domestic actors. And they're inviting it, they're setting it up this way, right? But like once you're the rebels in the government operating this and you're trying to like push your limits a little bit, you're going to criticize the international actor inherently. So I actually think that these sort of like um, processes of backlash, especially from the leaders should be almost inherent. And that's what we see, like in the case of Guatemala, many, many leaders have come, like um, not many, many leaders, but there have been a number of different presidents who have come through the SISIG um, administration, which is sort of this outside actor. And each one of them, when they're campaigning, they say, oh, SISIG is really important, you know, lack of corruption, really important. And then once they get into office, they start critiquing um, SISIG. And so I think it is almost this inherently conflictual relationship between the domestic and the international actor. In some ways, that's the way in which it's designed. But for average citizens in many of these cases, they actually tend to be very supportive. So there have been huge protests in favor of SISIG, the um, outside actor in Guatemala, um, especially when these sort of leaders sought to um, suspend it. So once it was in the country and operating, um, you know, even though leaders would say things like, oh, this is anti-sovereign or this is colonialist, um, you know, critique it in many different ways, a lot of the actual citizens in the country saw it as being beneficial and as cleaning up their um, justice system in ways that was really, were really important to them going forward. Um, so I think you can often get, you should almost get backlash based on the way that they're designed, but that in many cases, the average citizens can be relatively supportive and actually be a stabilizing force as this goes forward over time. Okay, wow. Um, thank you so much for uh, thoroughly answering my questions. So um, now we're going to switch over um, to discuss the role of economic development in post-conflict states. So to facilitate this, this discussion, we are joined by economics professor Sergio Scaperdas. Um, professor Scaperdas holds the Clifford S. Hines Chair on the Economics of Peace at the University of California, Irvine. In July 2016, he was appointed director of the Center for Global Peace and Conflict Studies. With the basic trade-off between production and appropriation at its core, Scaperdas has developed a theoretical framework that allows the study of a variety of economic and political problems, including those of organized crime, the emergence of states and governance, civil wars and other forms of domestic conflict, as well as the effects of globalization and the presence of insecurity. His research has been published in a variety of economics and political science journals, including the American Economic Review, the American Political Science Review, Economic Journal, the Journal of Conflict Resolution, the Journal of Economic Theory, and the Journal of International Economics. 
Oh, Professor, I think you are on mute. All right, can you see the... Yes, yes, we can hear you and see your um, presentation. Okay, let me... Uh, let me try, sorry, I was... Uh, I cannot find the, the view. Oh, um, I believe okay. you could go All into- All right, the slideshow again. Slideshow, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I'm not exactly gonna talk about economic development. Uh, I'm gonna primarily actually uh, uh, focus on the role of national identity, something which is unusual for economics. I can talk uh, a bit more about economic development for sure. But uh, my talk is actually very much uh, complementary, emphasizes a few different things, but it's necessary what uh, Professor Matter uh, emphasized and discussed. So um, uh, what I will discuss, first of all, what is nation building? Because this is something that uh, when I was invited about the, that uh, your conference was about nation building. First of all, try to define what nation building is. Uh, Talk about the role of national identity as an important component of nation building. Um, if I have time, I might uh, skip the, this part about nation building through war that we have there. And finally discuss uh, whether, how, or whether can external intervention build a nation, right? Instead of uh, just building uh, a state or helping build a state. So this uh, is uh, what I'm uh, discussing today is partly based on uh, research that uh, uh, in collaboration with two political scientists, Nicholas Sampanis and uh, Bill Walford, as well as a former student economist of mine who is at Tulane. Uh, but of course, uh, I'm, uh, my authors are not responsible for this presentation because I'm emphasizing and there are things that are not in the papers that we have. Okay, so first of all, what is nation building? I think there are three components that one could put together or maybe two. Uh, one is state building, building state capacity, capacity to tax, effective bureaucracy, uh, legal capacity, the, uh, both uh, and in that we can include policing uh, as well as the rule of law the regulatory framework for markets and other uh, economic activities. So this is partly, I mean, mostly what uh, Professor Martin emphasized, as well as something that uh, sort of changing differently, trying to manage conflict, uh, develop institutions that distribute power so that you go from fighting in the battlefields to arguing in parliaments, courts, uh, the public sphere, the public square, developing institutions of checks and balances, including possibly democracy. And I think uh, democracy having a, is a big check on uh, those in power, um, having civilian control of the military and uh, develop in the end the monopoly in the, what Weber calls the legitimate means of violence in order to have a modern viable state. Um, and the last thing that has not, does not receive as much attention, and I'm emphasizing here, is the instilling national identity, having the citizens identifying with the state, and how this is complementary, sort of they go together with state building and managing conflict. So what does national identity, what do we mean by that? Uh, is first of all, identifying with a nation. What is uh, Benedict Anderson called part of an feeling like a member of the of an imagined community? Saying we when we're discussing public matters. What are we gonna do in Iraq if you are an American and you are thinking? And when you do that, you uh, implicitly or, or explicitly identify as a member of a political community of a, of a national identity. Now, traditionally, they, especially for European nation states, uh, language, religion, or ethnicity have been the building blocks of national identity, but uh, you can have also more inclusive attributes that can form this basis. And uh, you have many countries that uh, 
from the United States and Mexico and Canada to Australia and India, where the basis of uh, national identity is not uh, what we consider primordial, this kind of characteristics of its citizens. Uh, uh, you have, and of course, it doesn't even require that the citizens agree what is the basis of national identity. Uh, in the US, Americans say we are Americans, uh, and when you have in surveys, they can be from all sorts of different things, uh, from the melting pot and diversity to being Christian or uh, having baseball or something like that. Uh, so it, it, as long as the citizens identify with the state, with the state identify as part of this political community. Uh, as an economist, I model this partly with psychological payoffs. Uh, you have material payoffs, there are economic payoffs, but there are also uh, psychological payoffs like status of the nation, the closeness of its citizens brings uh, they are to other citizens, and that can play the issue of ethnicity and religion and language play a role there. Um, so why, why do you have this uh, national identity is almost is universal in every nation state, something that you usually don't pay much attention, but modern states, contrary to pre-modern states, are universally having a well-defined try, or at least in trying to instill that uh, uh, national identity. It overcomes free rider problems and facilitates collective action. Uh, if, uh, if uh, you know, in a, in, in a pre-modern society, a state, you have two villages that are next to each other that might be speaking different dialects, uh, might be belonging to different tribes, they are sort of in, uh, at each other's throats through, through history. Uh, they have tribal laws and other things that, uh, well, a national identity overcomes these issues and you, have, you can have more easily collective action that reduces internal conflicts, first of all, the, the conflicts within uh, uh, the pr uh, previously sort of communities that were much fragmented. It decreases public good provision. It allows us for it allows them to uh, collectively organize and provide public goods at the at the regional or uh, national level. Um, enhances state building, um, and I think I would argue is a essential ingredient of nation building and economic growth. Uh, and you can see that countries that do not have this uh, social cohesion comes from uh, national common national identity. Uh, do not have higher levels of economic performance. And countries that do, do have those things. Uh, the way that forging national identity in, uh, has sometimes, uh, often, has uh, involved a lot of coercion uh, and, uh, or uh, propaganda, mass education in the 19th century Europe uh, is to turn Frenchmen into, uh, sort of peasants into Frenchmen. You have rituals from national days, parades, flags, uh, national anthems. You have economic, cultural, and sports and other national accomplishments, uh, accomplishments that uh, enhance uh, national prestige. Uh, the media enhancement, enhancement of those through initially from uh, newspapers in the 19th century, but uh, uh, in the 20th century, we have radio and TV, and now we have... Um, uh, new social media and other ways. Uh, so internal conflicts often sharpen identities, uh, possibly including making national identity more salient, but also it can make some national identities more sal uh, salient too. Um, external ones can enhance national identity, and uh, that's uh, something that... Uh, uh, many uh, European states did that, and uh, uh, with the uh, incessant warfare that the warfare that uh, had early in history, but uh, later in the 19th and 20th centuries was, was uh, you had the 20th, you had the first and second world war, of course, uh, being important for that. Uh, so. So what is then a relationship between nation building and national identity? Um, it appears to be necessary for state building and therefore for nation building. Uh, 
Uh, you can think of state building as the hardware and national identity as the software of the nation building. Um, but state building itself takes long to achieve, decades, and it's a never-ending process, of course. We can always improve it, at least de decades. Uh, the Ba'ath Party, for example, in Iraq uh, and afterwards during Saddam Hussein, was able to build actually a pretty, uh, in, in terms of the nuts and bolts of state, of, of, of the bureaucracy and state building, was pretty effective in that, but not in reducing internal conflicts through checks and balances and other ways that would uh, reduce, uh, that kept conflicts under wraps. Um, uh, but forging national identity is even more difficult than state in building, taking many decades, if not centuries, to accomplish. Uh, France is considered the quintessential uh, nation state, but uh, and he had a long history of statehood. Uh, but even in the after the revolution, most Frenchmen did not speak French, and they did not become Frenchmen, according to some arguments, until World War I, right, in many ways. Uh, and uh, external actors, it can hardly instill a national identity in another country, except inadvertently, except as uh, when they, you fight them, and in ways that are unpredictable often, and it's difficult to figure out how. Ex ante, that is, for the, the external interventions. Uh, so, now, traditionally in Europe, for many countries in Europe, national identities were forged in international wars. An example of that is the German unification that was, uh, took place after the Franco-Prussian uh, war, that Germany was not a state. It's, uh, it was Prussia, was the dominant part of it. And uh, so what you had at the time, uh, you had... Um, Prussia, which was the dominant European state, uh, German state, and here is a, a picture, a, a map of uh, Germany before reunification. The green parts are part of Prussia that were actually, most of them in the West were conquered very uh, recently before the 1870s. Um, it was the dominant state and Bismarck was attempting to unify Germany but the southern, especially the southern elites, Bavaria and uh, places there, were really um, uh, very hesitant. And in some ways, I mean, there, there is a lot of historical uh, and other social scientific arguments that said that uh, Bismarck instigated essentially the Franco-Prussian War as a way of forcing the Southern elites to unify Germany and uh, sort of, uh, I will not go into the details. Uh, it did not, Bismarck did not seek to achieve a monolithic national state similar to France, but instead he put to absorb the German nationalities without nullifying them. Okay, now, uh, what about external interventions? And what about new states uh, that have come into existence in post-colonial times uh, or earlier than that, or a bit later, like in uh, East, Eastern Europe, or often in Africa and other places? They often have low state capacity, uh, high internal conflicts, and no levels of national identification. They have either fragmented identities or polarized identities uh, in some ways. They are susceptible as a result to external interventions that could be political, geopolitical, overt, covert, or military, outright military interventions. Um, and the worst cases, uh, the, uh, the most unlikely ones become proxy wars and battlegrounds of external powers. Uh, so what you have examples, uh, Afghanistan repeatedly in its history has been a battleground of proxy, you know, during the great game between uh, uh, um, the British Empire 
and the Indian from India and Russia. Uh, more recently, <laughs> both uh, the Soviet Union and now the, I mean, in the US. You can say it's been a battleground for the US, although the US went uncontested. In some ways, Pakistan also was intervening in many ways that was uh, uh, contrary to the interests of the US. Uh, you had Vietnam, Angola, Nicaragua, and other countries during the, the Cold War. Uh, you have the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zaire, uh, from 1995 on, that you had uh, Rwanda being fer the first one that intervened, external power that intervened, but then almost everybody from Libya all the way to Zambia became involved somehow in the tragic war in the DRC, where you had... Uh, estimated more than 5 million deaths. And Ukraine more recently is another kind of example. Uh, and the result is often long-term instability, the low state capacity, the conflicts, the low level of national identification, and the, of course, the economic effects are uh, obviously not there. They're there pretty bad. And they are subject, subject to repeated intervention. What about better cases that are not battlegrounds? Right? What about unilateral external interventions that you have sort of say one country goes in without, uh, not goes in, but provides uh, uh, one type of external intervention without having a, a battleground with this? Well, they can improve the state's military capacity. They can improve the state capacity and state building of the country itself. Uh, so, for example, South Korea after we, uh, Korean War is a successful example of the U.S. helping in both these uh, dimensions, but also South Korea had um, a national identity that was pretty strong already. And that was, a, I think, in my view, a critical factor on how a country like South Korea that in the 1950s had per capita income lower than say a country than Ghana, why it uh, was able to uh, uh, develop so much, partly because it did help, help from the US in state building, in uh, economic help in terms of opening up its markets and technical help uh, that, that uh, South Korea had, but it also because it had a, a, a very something to build on in terms of national identity pretty quickly. Uh, but if we accept that national identity is an important ingredient of nation building, is can an outside power instill and solidify a national identity out of the blue? Uh, I'm doubtful of that. And in many ways, it can actually sabotage national identity and nation building, as, for example, uh, the US did in uh, Iraq, because there were the elements of, uh, I mean, it was the, in the process of developing a, an Iraqi identity that now is probably more fragmented than before uh, the US intervention in Iraq. And at the same time, uh, Ambassador Bremer actually uh, abolished essentially the bureaucracy and the small state capacity that uh, Iraq had at the time. So uh, unilateral external, uh, external interventions are unlikely to succeed in nation building unless you have ingredients like those in uh, South Korea that were sort of aligned in many ways. And you had huge amounts of effort on the part of the outside interview. Okay, I guess uh, that's uh, it. And uh, I can open it to questions. Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, na national identity is, is always something that is such an interesting topic to me because we see it every day, you know, in, in our country, like America. And, um, you know, we grow up for those, you know, who grew up here, we you know, recite 
the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. We sing national anthems before every sports game. And so, um, I mean, no, that's not, you know, nation building, but that's, I think, an example of ensuring um, national identity. Um, so while we wait for attendees to submit their questions, um, I have a question for you, Professor. So um, I know I learned in a class previously that some states use violence, especially war, to maintain the control and influence over the state by using national identity and um, bringing together the people to um, kind of rally up the country and um, ensure national identity. Um, so how does that affect states that are like fragile um, or in the middle of trying to establish a state? Well, when you do have, uh, a, you, you have civil wars and you emphasize you, you, you try to eliminate essentially uh, another ethnicity, it, it is uh, extremely, it can be extremely brutal and violent and often does not lead to effective results. Uh, so, um, it, it, even in countries like uh, what you have in countries like the, the already pre-established states, nation states that have a, a, a strong sense of national identity, say for example, Spain, right? In periods of stress, you have things like Catalonian nationalism appearing. And what it does make, I mean, the, it, it usually creates interventions that have, that are violent, actually enhance the sub-ethnic identity, right? There were Catalonians of Spanish descent or residents of Catalonia of Spanish descent who really became almost Catalonian uh, 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 nationalists after the intervention, the violent intervention during the, in a, a couple of years ago of the Spanish government. And this st uh, stays as a wound in there uh, that can fester for years, decades, centuries even, in terms of grievances in other words. So, uh, uh, and you can have, uh, so it is not, that's why a lot of the, conflicts that you have, civil wars and others, so, are so intractable uh, and uh, long-lasting. Interesting. Um, thank you for um, answering that question. And um, I have one, oh, I think we have a couple of questions um, from the Q&A, so we'll move on to those. So, um, so someone asked, how do you see, the, oh, two professors compared us, how do you see the risk of too much national identity, such as when national identity leads to xenophobic policies, ethnic violence, or similar things? And how do you think states can balance national identity without going too far? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, how you define, there is not a unique way of defining, defining national identity. Mm -hmm. So when you have... Uh, uh, wh when you have in the U.S., uh, some um, when you survey Americans, they say, "Well, it's uh, being an American is to be Christian or sort of uh, be an American football." Or you have other Americans who emphasize uh, the melting pot or emphasizing the uh, multiculturalism and other issues. So what you have then. There is not, it depends on what the state chooses and politicians choose to emphasize. And sometimes politicians can use uh, one definition, one way, try to veer the definition of national identity through their own perhaps narrow ethnic group or narrowly ethnic, so as to gain politically but at the expense of uh, overall uh, 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 overall welfare for the country, or there are other politicians that can emphasize more uh, uh, more universal identity. So what you have is uh, uh, for India, for example, 
it's been uh, since its independence, there was an ethos of uh, unity through diversity. Or, and remarkably, you know, you have India that is a country that is uh, in many ways in linguistically and in other ways more diverse than the whole of Europe, uh, being able to have to sustain a democracy for all these years. Now we see over the past, uh, how many years is it now? Seven years since Modi was a uh, thing. You have a gradual move towards Hidutva being the primary way of uh, defining, or at least the, the, not the primary way, it's what the government in power tries to emphasize as the national identity of the country. So th th there, is, there is not national identity, there is not a unique way to define national identity. So, and a lot of it is part of the, um, of the political part, it depends on the political equilibrium, the political process, but it is, uh, uh, but there is no, I mean, we are, we are still are, and we will be for some time, sort of nation states. Uh, it, it will be very difficult. We, we cannot have world government any, anytime soon. Uh, we cannot have even a European government anytime soon, a European Union. There is no, uh, the European Union it, it, it tries to define uh, its supranational identity, but most Europeans, especially the rank of file, most citizens do, are, do not feel primarily Europeans. So we are, we are living in, uh, in uh, uh, nation states, and uh, we will have, by definition, a national identity. The question is, this national, what kind of national identity does its state have? Yeah. Great. Thank you for answering the question. So um, I would like to answer, uh, ask a question that was posed to Professor Matnock. Um, so how does the re-emergence of private military companies and other semi-state actors alter this dynamic? I know specifically, specifically that certain governments in the Sahel have turned to Wagner Group and other unconventional actors to supplement traditional security agreements. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, there's some really interesting new data on these questions as well. So um, Debbie Avant at um, Denver University uh, and co-authors have some cool new projects on um, actually measuring private um, military companies. Um, so we can actually look at this as a question, uh, you know, as a research question. Um, but I think in terms of shared sovereignty, private military companies are interesting because they really are more in this contracting framework, right? Like we actually do have a lot of literature, especially in comparative politics, about when it is that states will privatize or contract what we see is like fundamental govern governance um, functions. So everything from sewage and uh, you know water services to schools um, to their security, right? And so like why exactly it is that they'll they'll use private military contractors is certainly interesting. Definitely fits in that literature. But I think in terms of like building states, um, this can be a substitute to the state backing functions that allies can sometimes provide. So like if you have a rebellion in part of your country and you just need more forces to be able to effectively fight it, maybe more forces that have you know, better equipment, you might be able to hire one of these contracting firms. It gets a little bit murkier on the shared sovereignty front. Um, once you're in sort of like a an area in which you um, have a foreign state that's hiring this foreign uh, company, right, to fight on your behalf. So it might be that one of your allies is willing to pay for the, the foreign military um, company that then comes in and, and fights on your behalf. And that gets a little bit murkier. It's closer to the shared sovereignty dimension that we were talking about before. But in theory, like these states have control over these military companies in that they can fire them um, and hire them, right? And so they're not sort of in the shared sovereignty realm that we really get to where we often get these like reform based changes right because that is basically just the state deciding on whether or not it's going to reform and implement a reform um, if it's contracting out to do that to a private company 
I do think it really speaks in very interesting ways, though, to what um, Professor Scopertas is talking about in terms of forming a nation state, right? That you have these private military companies that maybe, you know, are fighting on behalf of the state, but do they fight in the same way you might expect your citizens to fight? Do they have the same allegiance that you might um, expect your citizens to have? So I think those are really good questions and really interesting questions to ask about this. But I think in terms of shared sovereignty, they fall much more into the contracting and privatization literature for me. Um, and thinking about why states would do that is certainly an interesting question, but in some ways a different one from asking why especially states would ask for these reform-based missions from other sovereign entities, so foreign states or intergovernmental organizations. Um, so that actually makes me question whether, so would you categorize the, uh, for example, like the US intervention in Iraq or Afghanistan as an invited intervention? No, so no, bo both of those would be invasions um, in the classification. And so thinking about the charts that I was showing earlier, those would be in the left-hand category where outside sovereign actors taking over. Um, and that's what, I mean, state building has been co-opted to mean those types of functions, but I think these shared sovereignty, these invited interventions are actually occurring much more commonly than we think of, and in many more cases, um, but just sort of aren't often called the state building um, that we, we probably should be calling them. Okay, so then what are some examples of sovereignty retained entirely by the host state? Would that include like the US intervention in, in Latin America during the Cold War or? So cases in which, so, okay, so we can think about the left-hand column, those would be Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Sovereignty taken over by an outside actor. They also include cases like um, Kosovo and um, Timor-Leste uh, to begin with, right? If they're new states, they're run entirely by the UN. Eventually they're handed over uh, in terms of power transition. State building that happens where the host state maintains complete control of its own security forces. This is happening every day, anywhere that foreign aid is given, right? Like some international actors might be involved in anyone's, uh, you know, policing systems. Like there's a decent amount of policing aid coming from the European Union. Um, but in those cases, those foreign actors don't have any say over how these many, many states take this aid and distribute it, right? So this, this is happening many cases of aid provision just generally. So I would say like basically all places where they're receiving aid, which is most developing countries, right? Most countries in which um, in the sort of low income or middle income classification of the World Bank standards um, are, are happening where they retain control and then are, are doing some of this uh, MC building functions, right? They're reforming their own um, security sectors. They're at least strengthening their own security sectors, right? It's all the same things that the US does uh, every day or that anyone else does every day in terms of thinking about how to run their institutions. Um, they just might be getting some foreign aid for that. So those would be the right-hand ca category. It's this middle category that I think is most interesting. And so these, I, I mentioned a couple of cases of this, this invited intervention where we had like, for example, Guatemala has CISIG. CISIG is these foreign prosecutors and investigators who are um, hired by the United Nations and they run their own unit in Guatemala to investigate crimes that are related to corruption in the security sector. Um, and so what they're doing there is actually investigating cases. They can choose and investigate cases, and then they can co-prosecute with Guatemalan co counterparts cases um, that they're invited to co-prosecute. And so those are the sort of fundamental shared sovereignty cases where you're actually reforming institutions and changing um, process and ruling on these inside of the context. And those are the cases where we really see this shared sovereignty. It's also a lot of like post-conflict policing operations in places like um, Sierra Leone, where, um, you know, there are outside actors who are helping police and reforming the policing services, um, but they're not sort of like, uh, there, is an, there is an autonomous state that has invited them to do this function um, after the conflict. Um, so those are the ones that fit in sort of this middle category, just to give you some examples across each of these. Oh, yes. Um, thank you for the clarification. Um, I have one question for Professor Scaperdas. Um, You said that there were many problems that come with external intervention um, sabotaging national identity. And this makes me think about how Western uh, nation states intervening in non-Western states are inherently just problematic or wrong or just doesn't work because of the religious or cultural differences that make up the national identity. Um, would you agree with that? Yes, <laughs> uh, 
Yes, I mean, going somewhere and thinking that you are gonna do democracy and human rights, especially actually that's sort of more egregious than saying, well, I'm going there for the oil or I'm going there for the diamonds or something like that. Uh, okay, you're going there for the diamonds. We know who you are, uh, you know, uh, but then saying, claiming that you are going for to, to build democracy and then sort of destroying even the elements of the base. I mean, to, to have democracy, you need to create a, a state, to have a state. Um, if you dissolve the existing state instead of using it, right? Uh, then it's even more egregious because uh, there is no chance of democracy, really. I mean, uh, democracy of uh, some of, uh, that it has any effectiveness. Uh, so it's not just for the, the issue of uh, destroying whatever equilibria there are there. Uh, it's uh, between the different uh, ethnic groups or other groups that there are there. Uh, destroying even sort of the beginnings of a state or, or whether it could be authoritarian or not, but it's it's better than having anarchy, right? And instead of having, uh, it's better to have a state, unfortunately, even though it's an authoritarian, than uh, having guns rule the place and having sort of uh, very, without any kind of even semblance of uh, a legal framework or recourse or policing or uh, anything of that sort. You, you, you have uh, your life is at uh, uh, the mercy of the mafioso or the gang leader uh, sort of at any moment. And uh, so, well, it goes beyond then just simply harming the whatever equilibrium exists among different uh, groups there in uh, the society and state. Interesting, thank you. Um, so another question that I have um, that you mentioned earlier about you were comparing state building um, as hardware and the national identity as software. Um, so how do countries that have a, a specific religion that plays a very large role in their government, such as Islamic countries, um, consider religion or national identity then? Like would they, or would you consider religion in those like in that context to be uh, like hardware or even both? Well, it, it, I mean, okay, the, the, it was an analogy. I think that would think it's closer to software than hardware, yes, because it is uh, religion, is in the minds of people. Uh, it's not uh, now that, although there are structures, but Islam uh, does not have uh, as much uh, kind of hierarchy and bureaucracy like Christianity has in uh, formal, formal institutions as Christianity has, but uh, overall, I would consider it more like a software with some hardware involved in it. And uh, now, and the conception of Islam uh, are sort of uh, varied conceptions of Islam as they are uh, varied conceptions of uh, Christianity. And you see, you know, if you look at the flags of the world, I would estimate a quarter of them have uh, the cross and a quarter of them have the uh, semi, uh, uh, how do you call it, the, the crescent, the, the, the crescent, which is the Islamic one, sort of. They were originally built on religion. You know, European states were originally built on religion. And a lot of Islamic states, uh, with, Islam, with Muslim my, my, uh, majorities, they, they used Islam as a connecting force, as a defining national identity. Uh, but you can have uh, varied uh, types of, uh, to the extent of uh, how national identity was defined. Uh, for example, until Erdogan, Turkey, although it has um, uh, the crescent in its uh, flag, it was highly secular state under Ataturk, right? Uh, and still it is uh, in many ways, even though Erdogan tries to formally, so it is uh, a, a secular state. And, um, and you have other states that uh, are more religious. I mean, uh, you have uh, perhaps uh, Saudi Arabia is the most one in many ways, but uh, others are not. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I know we're running short a little bit around time now. So before um, I pass off to Jackson, uh, Professor Matnock, I have one question about um, your collecting of data um, and encoding whether that no, no missions entered with, with consent or not. And so by collecting data of how these states are operating, um, how do you, or like, how are you going to use that information? Um, are we going to see this in your um, upcoming book and how can people or states use this information in future state building? Yes, yeah, so the book, uh, the data collection is both for the book and then we're writing a side project together with a graduate student here at, at Berkeley, we're writing a side project about it. But I do hope that it will be useful for states. I also hope that going forward, um, there will be better data collection on this because as I mentioned, we've had to go to like 12 different sources to try to figure out where foreign forces are going. And there are some reasons why you might not always want to make this overt. There's been great work about like covert uh, interventions in general um, in political science. But I think that, you know, in there are um, some advantages to sort of thinking about this as invited intervention, especially for international policymakers. Um, they might be able to clarify the concept and then actually be able to figure out where this works and when this might be an option. Um, and so hopefully going forward, it will also be of use to policymakers. Um, and we plan to release the data um, once we finish cleaning it uh, and um, are publishing with it um, in this book and article project as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I think I will, um, thank you so much for talking and um, using your time to talk to us about nation building and nation identity um, and using um, nation and national identity for security um, and even coding and collecting information about these um, interventions. So um, with that, I'll pass it off to Jackson for final remarks. Uh, thank you much, very much for the invitation and for the exciting panel. Yes, thank you very much. Great to be here. Yes, I'd like to repeat what Mika said. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Mika for moderating the panel and thank you for all you attendees for coming to um, here are wonderful speakers today. Um, I certainly learned a lot. I hope everybody else in the, uh, who attended also did. Um, thank you again to all of our other speakers who came today. Um, and that's it for today. Hopefully, if you go to Tufts and you're attending this, you can join us for a simulation tomorrow. Um, if not, then thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you again to our speakers.